shot you right now. What would you do if I... I was afraid. I'm standing about ten feet from his dead body. I want you to open it up, walk outside the door with your hands in front of... I gave him his nose dog. Initially, this seems like another typical love story about an upper-class boy and a middle-class girl, drenched in unrequited love. However, this crime has details so gruesome and psychotic, you will never believe that it's true. Take a trip with us as we discover the unfathomable details of Ryan Poston's final moments and the bizarre comments his girlfriend made afterward. Often compared to the infamous criminal Jody Arias, who ended her boyfriend's life in 2008. Ryan Carter Poston was born on December 30, 1982, to his parents Jay Poston and Lisa Carter in an upper class neighborhood in Fort Mitchell, Kentucky. Fort Mitchell is known for having predominantly white residents with only 3.4% of the population falling under the poverty line. Ryan was the first of four children. He had three younger sisters named Allison, Catherine, and Elizabeth. The family was described as being very close with each other, and Ryan was described as a charismatic ladies' man. His parents paid for him to attend school across seas at the International School Manila in the Philippines and the International School of Geneva in Switzerland before he even turned 18. Upon graduating high school, Ryan attended Indiana University where he triple majored in political science, geography, and history. He then went on to complete his law degree at Salmon P. Chase College of Law at Northern Kentucky University in Highland Heights. He enjoyed hanging out with his friends at bars, debating over topics like politics and philosophy. He was also fond of collecting guns and believed they made society safer. His friends described him as magnetic, someone you always wanted to be around. In 2009, Ryan was in a relationship with a girl named Lauren Worley for about two years. They met at a bar in Cincinnati. Three days after the two met, she already had a key to his apartment. Shortly after that, they bought two dogs together, Lily and Max. Lauren was studying at the same law school Ryan had just graduated from, and Ryan was preparing for the bar exam. After he passed the exam, Ryan opened his own law firm with a business partner. It was common in Ryan's family for the men to become lawyers. Both his grandfather and uncle practiced law as well. Everything seemed perfect in their relationship. Lauren's roommate even described Ryan as being perfect for her. She related him to the character Edward in Twilight. You know, the character Edward, he is just such a protector, so soft-spoken, always there. Even his build was similar to Ryan's. With smoldering eyes similar to Robert Pattinson's character in Twilight, it seemed impossible for someone of his nature to settle down so quickly. Which is why when Ryan and Lauren called it quits, there were a million other girls waiting in line to date him, including Shayna Hubbers. As so many romances begin, Ryan met his on-again, off-again girlfriend, Shayna Hubbers, online. Ryan's step-cousin, Carissa Carlisle, was a mutual friend on Facebook, and the two began speaking regularly. Lauren always claimed that Shayna was just a rebound, but Shayna believed that they were more. Shayna Michelle Hubers was born on April 8, 1991, to her parents, Sharon and Robert Hubers, in Lexington, Kentucky. She was their only child and grew up in a middle-class neighborhood. She was known to her schoolmates as the pretty, intelligent girl. She achieved good grades and eventually studied psychology at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. However, she was known to have problems with maintaining friendships and romantic relationships. Her friends said she loved drama on and off the stage. When she was rejected, she took it extremely hard. Not long after Shayna and Ryan began dating, she graduated and began studying for her master's degree in school counseling. The two had a relationship full of ups and downs. Many people described it as volatile at times. Between the stress from studying for a master's degree and opening a law firm, the two were often seen fighting. Shayna's mother didn't have a good feeling about their relationship from the beginning. 
When she first met Ryan in 2011, Sharon Hubbers described her daughter's new boyfriend as a creep. I was taken aback. He couldn't look me in the face. I saw some weapons stuff all over the kitchen table and counter, claimed Sharon. It was often perceived that Shayna looked at Ryan as a chance to move up in the world. A man of wealth and notoriety, she always claimed she wanted to marry a lawyer or a doctor. Ryan's friends, on the other hand, had a different view of their relationship. They claimed that Ryan lost interest in Shayna quickly and attempted to break it off several times, but Shayna would not leave him alone. In one text exchange between Ryan and a friend, he was asked if he was still dating What's-Her-Name, to which he responded with, Shayna, yes. The friend then asked how it was going, and Ryan said, it's okay, I'm pretty stressed. I received 75 text messages from her. I'm emotionally and mentally spent. I hope she leaves me alone. In a text Shayna sent to one of her friends, she said, he says he's only with me because I make him feel so awful when I cry. My love has turned to hate. However, by 2012, they were still in a relationship. The pair went to Ryan's parents' house for dinner and to watch a vice presidential debate. After dinner, he told his stepfather, Peter Carter, that he was going to end the relationship. He already had a blind date set up with Miss Ohio, Audrey Bolt, the following night. Okay, we're not relationship professionals, but why would you bring someone to a family dinner that you had been dating on and off for over a year, then plan a date with a new woman the following night? It's pretty obvious that they were mutually to blame for the toxic relationship they had formed. Ryan described Shayna to his friends as restraining order level crazy and literally probably the craziest person I have ever met. She almost scares me. Shayna's friends said that Ryan was playing games with her and mentally harmed her. They claimed she was always running errands for him, taking his dogs for walks and bringing him meals. He would apparently call her names and claim she needed a job and a facelift. However, Ryan's friends and ex-girlfriend said he would never say these things about a woman. On the early morning of October 13th, 2012, the same night of the vice presidential debate dinner with Ryan's family, Shayna called her mother at 3 a.m. crying. Her mother said she was sick. She was in pain. There was fear in her voice. Shayna's mother drove to Ryan's condo and spent the morning with her. The pair spent the day together shopping, but Shayna was apparently texting Ryan, saying that she was having health problems and that her mother had taken her to the hospital, which was not true. Ryan told Shayna he didn't want to see her again that weekend, but wouldn't go into detail as to why. We of course know that he had the blind date set up with Audrey and most likely wanted a new relationship to provide space between him and Shayna. Ryan and Audrey also met through a mutual friend on Facebook. They began talking to each other when Ryan shared a movie review under one of Audrey's posts. Audrey was described as bubbly and personable. Their mutual friend thought that the two would make a great match. They originally discussed meeting at Ryan's condo when he was done working, but they changed their minds and decided to meet at a bar called Milford Inn. Their plan was to meet around 9 p.m., but after the two exchanged a few text messages about their excitement for the date, including Ryan saying he was about to leave, the communication died. An hour and a half later, Audrey was waiting at the bar, wondering if she had been stood up. She said, I mean, I'm a girl, so I was like, where is this guy? Like, where is he? He was very, you know, responsive to text messages. I had just talked to him. He said, okay, no problem, see you there. But Ryan never showed up. Unannounced, Shayna had shown up to Ryan's condo that evening to talk about their relationship. She claimed that the two got into a fight, then he carried her out of the apartment. When she returned inside to grab her stuff, she saw that he had a weapon in his hand. She struggled to grab it from him, then finally had it in her hand. She fired several times and ended his life. In her call to 911, she said, Ma'am, my, my boyfriend in self-defense. I'm at 12 Meadow Lane. My gun is in the house. I laid it on the bookshelf. I'm standing about 10 feet from his dead body. He's dead, ma'am. He's completely dead. 
She went on to explain in detail how it was self-defense and how all she wanted to do was grab her stuff and leave, but he threw her across the room into the couch. When she asked the dispatcher if the police would arrest her, it's hard to tell if she's erratic due to ending Ryan's life or if it's because she knows she just committed a crime. Yeah, and they're gonna arrest me? Ma'am, I don't know what they'll do. We're gonna send, send them out. I'm gonna stay on line with you, okay? However, it's clear she had two main objectives she wanted to get across in the phone call. One, she acted in self-defense. And two, she wanted to know if she would be arrested. She then told the dispatcher that she saw him twitching, so she wanted to make sure she put him out of his misery. Once police entered the scene, Shayna was arrested and brought to the department for questioning. Sergeant David Fornash Jr. from the Highland Heights Police Force was on the scene to investigate the crime. As he entered, he could see Ryan's lifeless body on the ground. He inspected each room in the condo to ensure there were no other individuals in the home, he then checked Ryan's pulse and confirmed his death. He claimed there was no directional spatter up onto the walls or ceiling, which counteracts Shayna's claim that she shot him after being thrown down onto the ground. Once he was done investigating the scene, Sergeant Dave Fornash Jr. headed back to the police department to question Shayna. Inside the interrogation room, she initially asked for an attorney. But when the sergeant asked her the name of the deceased, she said, She then goes on to explain what happened instead of invoking her right to silence. Honestly, like, shot the man in self-defense. He was throwing me around the room. As soon as it happened, it was surreal. It was like I was out, it was out of body experience. It was like that was not me. When the sergeant left the room, it was obvious that Shayna was nervous. She began fidgeting, pacing, and drinking several cups of water. When another officer comes in to sit with her, she shares more. That is my person. Picking me up and throwing me against the bookshelf. That's when he started screaming all the nasty things at me. You're a Everyone knows you're crazy. He sat at the dining room table, handling his semi automatic then pointed it at her and said, What would you do if I saw you right now? What would you do if I, I was afraid? Shayna then went on to say that Ryan had been overtaking prescription medications for years. Multiple bottles were found on the crime scene, including on the table besides Ryan's body. As the situation went on, the police never asked Shayna any questions since she asked for an attorney, but she kept talking on her own and her story started to change. She claimed he was sitting at the table with the weapon when she aimed it at him. Then, as he lay on the ground twitching, she shot him five more times in the face. In a cold demeanor, she said, I gave him the nose job he always wanted. She became increasingly more unstable as she laughed at herself and wondered what life was going to be like in prison. She talked to herself while alone in the room constantly and even began dancing ballet and singing Amazing Grace. On December 20th, 2012, Shayna was indicted for and on January 16th, 2013, she entered a not guilty plea. The story hit the media and every news outlet across America began sharing the story of what happened to Ryan. The country was captivated. In 2014, Shayna took the stand in her own defense during a bond hearing to attempt the possibility of bail. She claimed she was horribly traumatized and in shock from the event that took place. She said she would have been hurt if she hadn't grabbed the weapon first, but the defense was not taking her allegations lightly. You would say anything to this court to get yourself out of jail. I'm talked about changing your hair, burning off your fingerprints. I think she is risk of flight. Her bail was denied. On April 13th, 2015, Shayna was on trial for m The prosecutors claimed that she showed up at Ryan's apartment that night while he was getting changed to go out for his date. Since he often carried a weapon with him, he most likely had taken it out of the holster to change and left it on the dining room table. When Shayna showed up, the prosecutors alluded to the idea that Ryan told Shayna he wanted to break up and that he was getting ready to go on a date with another woman. This was when they said she grabbed the weapon and attacked. The defense, of course, claimed that Shayna killed Ryan in self-defense due to the fact that she was the victim of long-term domestic harm. 
They said that she had bruises on her arms, legs, and torso after the events that took place that fateful night. They also said he was a young man fueled by anger. Online messages about his business partner proved that. In 2012, Ryan was being sued by his former law partner, and he was enraged. In a message to a friend, he said, There's nothing I want more than to just scorch the earth and leave this entire city in a pile of burnt rubble. He also sent a message to his co-worker, Crystal Ohosho, saying, I want this piece of expletive destroyed. Bury him neck deep at low tide, throw darts at his head, wait for high tide to roll in so I can stomp on his head while he's drowning. Shayna's mother also said that he regularly did target practices with his weapons outside his condo building and would randomly pick one up in his living room and fire at a book on the shelf while Shayna was in the apartment with him. Neighbors Dora and Vernon West were witnesses in the trial. They said that the night of the event, they heard two bangs consecutively, then four more after. They also mentioned if there had been a verbal or physical altercation, they would have heard it through the walls, and they did not. Once again, Shayna changed her story about those four final firings. She claimed that she thought Ryan would get up and hurt her if she didn't end his life. Another text message from Shayna that came out during the trial was the phrase, when she goes to the range with Ryan tonight, she wants to turn around, shoot, and end him, and play like it's an accident. Forensics expert Howard Ryan testified that the first hit to Ryan's head happened while he was still sitting down. He slumped forward onto the table, then she got him again in the back. As he began falling to the ground, she did it four more times. He said if he was in an upright position, the gravity would have brought it down, straight down to the shirt, through the bottom of the shirt of the pants. Three fellow inmates were brought into court to testify that Shayna showed zero remorse. They claimed that she was the aggressor in the fight and that she planned to plead insanity. She mentioned, however, that she was too smart to do so because she had an IQ of Einstein. So she was going to plead the wife battered syndrome and say he beat her. Finally, the last informant said Shayna was aware of the date with Miss Ohio, and that was her breaking point. Another shocking detail that was exposed in the trial was that Shayna actually called her mother before she called 911 when she ended Ryan's life. Her mother claimed she was hysterical, terrified, and in shock. She told Shayna to call 911 immediately. The defense claimed that the variety of prescription medication in Ryan's toxology report could have caused him to fly into a fit of rage. The toxologist, Dr. Saeed Jortani, said, What these illegal substances do, they basically cause indecence of behavioral discontrol and hostile outbursts. As closing arguments began, the defense continued to claim that it was Shayna's obsession with being Ryan's girlfriend and maintaining that relationship that caused her to end his life. With the downward angle trajectory of the bullet, it was obvious that she was standing above him when she used the weapon. The case went to the jury for only five hours before they returned with the verdict, guilty. The jury took only an hour to make their recommendation that Shayna should be punished for the offense at 40 years confinement in the penitentiary. Ryan's family members made impact statements, stating that they will never be able to see him grow up and have a family of his own. Shallow victory, our son is dead, said his mother Lisa. Three months later, they were all back in court. The defense attempted to achieve a shorter sentence for Shayna, trying to prove that she was a victim of domestic abuse. However, the judge found that because they were not domestic partners living together, she was not considered a victim of domestic harm. While in jail, Shayna met her partner, Unique Taylor, a trans woman who was in prison for robbery after being a frequent felony offender. The two petitioned for a marriage license, and on June 7, 2018, their license was granted, and the two were married. In an interview, Shayna described their relationship. I can only describe it as um, like a spiritual encounter that I had with another person that I met here a couple years ago that I grew to know over the years. Mm -hmm. And we just got really close, and um, you know, we're both forced into a similar situation. 
and unique and I um, have a lot in common and we just grew very close over the years. Shayna first met Unique when she was brought to an indoor recreational facility that was besides Unique's cell. They struck up a conversation and found that they had similar intelligence and ideologies of the world. Shayna never judged Unique on her feeling of gender and looking back now it seems that Unique very much felt non-binary. Shayna continued to claim that she never saw Unique's gender and rather saw their beautiful, intelligent soul, and that is what she fell in love with. However, unfortunately for the two, shortly after the marriage, Unique was released and the pair filed for divorce, stating irreconcilable differences. On August 8, 2018, Shayna received a retrial due to the fact that one of the original jury members during her first trial was a convicted felon. He had apparently skipped on several child support payments and was not aware of his criminal history. In the new trial, the jury continued to recommend a sentence of 40 years and eligibility for parole after serving 20. In the second trial, Shayna's new defense lawyer claimed that she had been harmed when she was younger by a friend, classmates, and even her father. Although these claims were not corroborated, a psychological study on her father found that he was, in fact, quite mentally ill. It's hard to say if any of them hurt Shayna the way she claimed. However, she also said when she told Ryan of these events that had taken place, he acted nonchalantly and didn't seem to care. She also said Ryan tried to force her into situations she did not want to be in, including with other people. Ryan's family was extremely angered by this. When a reporter asked his father if he had anything to say, he exclaimed, Oh, God, no. Rot in hell. She's going where she deserves to be, and where she's going, Mommy can't help her. Shayna was her mother's whole world, and she will never accept that her daughter is a She said, Mommy will always be there. I'll draw my last breath helping that baby. She doesn't deserve this. She did nothing wrong. It is evident that social media and the use of text messaging were massive in this case. One of the officers said that there were over 50,000 pages of conversation between the pair. Another major topic in this case is the mental stability and the length some people will go to to deny rejection. Brian had been more firm with ending the relationship with Shayna, possibly in a public setting. Would his life have been taken? If he had stopped sending mixed messages to Shayna, would she continue to want to be with him? and eventually harm him anyway. Unfortunately for Ryan's family, a young life was taken away, one full of intelligence and love for others. On top of that, Shayna could have gone on to achieve her master's degree and find someone worthy of her love instead of fixating on one person who clearly was not in love with her. One thing that remains true is that Shayna has never once shown sympathy for Ryan's family or remorse for causing his death. She continues to evade questions regarding her conviction and refuses to comment on Ryan's death. In 2021, Lifetime aired a series called Cellmate Secrets. In an episode, Shayna's former cellmates described some interesting ways that Shayna would vie for attention. Cicely Miller said, male inmates would come in there and serve and she would come out there in a white tank top, no bra on, and her panties and they would tell her, Miss Hubbers, you need to get dressed. They say, Miss Hubbers, do not talk to the inmates. She'd ignore them and try to talk and, you know, say, what are you doing? What's your name? Another inmate, Holly Nevin, said, there's a lot of things that Shayna would do to get attention. She would run out of her room naked to get attention from the guards. Shayna has two major Facebook groups that support her campaign to be released, and hundreds of her supporters have donated money to her. She even has an online profile at the jail she's in that states she's open to receiving mail and hopes to find someone who will love her regardless of her past. Her description is somewhat eerie, almost reading as a dating profile. One section says, I'm a tall and thin brunette standing at 5'8 and a half inches tall, 120 pounds with lots of long, wavy, golden brown hair, big steel blue doe eyes, and a wide, bright smile on a heart-shaped face. This case is definitely full of ups and downs, just like Ryan and Shayna's tumultuous relationship. Shayna's parole hearing is scheduled for the year 2032. She'll be 41 years old. How do you all feel about this case? Do you think it's eerily similar to Jodi Arias' case? 
If you haven't heard of Jody before, you can find our video detailing that crime on the profile. Let us know what you think. And don't forget to click that notification bell, like the video, and subscribe to our channel. Until next time.